think big and act. This is a wonderful claim. You could print it on a t-shirt, you could do a, a, a sticker and glue it on your automobile or on your bicycle, uh, but it, it could be just be a meaningless, fancy wording, but not when it's said by someone who, who has already delivered change. Not when is said and presented by Gunther Poldi. I'm very honored and very happy to uh, call Gunther to the stage. Thank you very much, Gunther. <laughs> well, you know how, how Gunther is always presented. Is the Steve Jobs of sustainability? Uh, is the uh, one of the founders of circular economy? I could go on uh, and on and on and on. You know the man. Fortunately, we all do, and now we are very happy to listen to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You allow me to keep standing? Yes, I do. Because this is not a moment to relax. You agree? Anyone who's relaxed now hasn't been listening to the real news and hasn't been getting ready to act. But first, I want to congratulate the organizers of the Planeteers. This is an act of perseverance. This is an act of going against the odds. This was not supposed to take place. I mean, everyone is being confined. Everyone is being told not to do anything. Everyone is told to just stop. And here in Lisbon, they decided to go against all odds. I decided to come here, even if they told me that if I come, I will be confined for two weeks. I decided to come, because if people decide to go, you must go along. Agree? Yeah. And let me make a very overall observation of the situation in the world today. If we were to do a test of the intelligence of all the people in this room, unfortunately, some IQs will be rather low. That means we're going to have a few people who would be considered by the others as stupid. If I were to now do a test with 100,000 people from Lisbon, I will find more stupid people. Now, does this mean there is a pandemic of stu stupidity? There's no pandemic of stupidity if you're testing more people. And I think we have to be very real. Whatever statistics we're getting today, we are in need of ignoring the statistics and deciding the way forward. That is what we have to do. Because if you follow the statistics, then you may be doing what this lady is doing early in the morning, watching her phone. What are you doing when you wake up in the morning? Are you grabbing your phone and having a look on the latest numbers of COVID cases? Are you looking at which country is prohibiting the Portuguese to come in? Or are you saying, I'm not even looking at this because I have made up my mind that we have to make a difference. That's what Planet Years is all about, making a difference. Making a difference while changing the rules of the game. We're not just going to make a difference. We're going to change the rules of the game. And this is the little factory that I constructed in 1991. It was considered to be the first ecological factory. Can you imagine 1991? Zero waste, zero emissions. And guess what? I had this incredible idea of paying my workers half a euro a kilometer to come to work. You know what happens if you pay people half a euro to come to work on a bicycle? Everyone on a bicycle. And then they have these economists, these people who count the numbers, right, the cash. They say, oh, but this must be very expensive. And I said, do you have an MBA? I said, yes. OK, so they didn't teach you at the MBA that when you make a cost calculation, 
of the parking space you need, the gate, the lights, the security, the ticket to go in and out. If you take the total cost in my factory at the time of all the parking paraphernalia we had, you know how much it was costing? Half a euro per kilometer for every worker for five years. Why don't we make those calculations? It's simple. But we don't do it. And this is the greatest challenge that I had. I built this incredible green industry, this factory with a green roof, this people that were all coming on a bicycle, and our deliveries were done with biodiesel from restaurant, from used restaurant oil. And then I went to Indonesia and I saw this. Because I was making detergents. And then I realized in Indonesia that I was not at all the green guru. I did have biodegradable products. And yes, I had a wooden factory. But my raw materials were palm oil. And palm oil was farmed on land that used to be a rainforest. I was responsible for the destruction of the habitat of the orangutan. Me, the green guy. Ladies and gentlemen, that is when I decided that we have to change the business models. My work from 1994 onwards has been to change the business model because we can't run business whereby the one who wins on the market is the cheapest. Competing with economies of scale, competing globally by being able to provide the lowest price on the market means that you can never take care of the environment and never take care of your workers. If we want to take care of the environment and our employees, we have an urgent need to change the business model and we will not compete on the basis of being the cheapest. We will compete on the basis of generating the most value with what we have. When I left Belgium, I'm a Belgian citizen, and the factory was in Belgium. When I left Belgium, I focused on a couple grand projects. Part of this drive to prepare for the Kyoto Protocol. I was in charge of the think tank at United Nations University to prepare the Kyoto Protocol. And one of those interesting ideas was that we should have social housing with solar energy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is still the largest social housing with solar energy in the world, and it was implemented in the 1990s. 70,000 apartments. You cannot imagine the city. Bogota, Colombia. I mean, not in Germany, not in California. They only talk about environment. They don't do it. If you want to have revolutionary projects, then you have to see it. But look at the large scale, 70,000 apartments. And the whole game was financial. Remember the talk about finance. We secured that the solar installations would work for 25 years. And as they worked for 25 years, we could include them in the mortgage. And as they were included in the mortgage, it was part of the building. It was not an additional cost of investment. It was part of the existing. This is the kind of thinking we need. And 25 years later, it is still working. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to think differently about housing. Here you see houses being constructed, prefabricated in Sweden. And do you know what material we're using? Recycled glass bottles. Recycled glass bottles. I thought there was a glut in the market. Well, exactly. That's why we need entrepreneurs who pick it up, transform it, not to make bottles again, but we're making 
buildings with grand insulation out of glass bottles. You know, in nature, nature is my master. And in nature, there is no tree that takes the leaves that fall in the fall and keeps them to reattach them in the spring. Stupid idea, right? We know this doesn't work. But that is what we're imposing with circular economy on quite a few of the industries. Reuse your materials. No, we need to upcycle the materials. We need to turn them into something that is more valuable. And as a result, I can make bottles in glass for free for a water company because I'm turning it into building materials afterwards. You see the logic? I mean, this is a different way of approaching. And so it's not that pet or glass, it's glass cannot be destroyed and will always be around. We went on to make air conditioning systems, as you can see here. Air conditioning systems, which is just a black wall with recycled aluminum on the inside. I'm not entering into all the details, but I just want you to see that Planeteers is a reality. We are changing things around, and we haven't started yesterday. We started 30 years ago. Here you see a school in Sweden where the air is refreshed every 30 minutes. No COVID there. Zero COVID cases. Why? Because the air is circulating everywhere. Why do we have so much indoor problems? And why do you have to put this on your mouth? Because we have no good air circulation. Change the air circulation and you will be able to do much better than ever before. The children are our priority. The health of the children are our priority. And so we need to design the architecture that permits us to do it. And inside the buildings, I'm shocked with this building. I don't see a plant. I don't see any plants growing around. How can you be talking about the planeteers and not having one plant, not even one rose here on the table? Do you agree? We need plants around us. They're our partners since millennia. And so we are organizing in buildings plants so that the natural filtration is done by the plants, so you must put them underneath the roof. And water. We need to generate water all the time. While I am speaking, I'm putting humidity in the air without a virus. I'm COVID negative. <laughs> and when we put humidity in the air, we need to find ways to capture that humidity. Ladies and gentlemen, with very simple, beautiful designs, you can ask yourself the question, in the inner city, is this art? Or is this making water available for everyone? Yeah, we are making water available for everyone. In the inner city. Now, you may say in Lisbon, the last few days, we didn't have a problem with water. But I know sometimes you do have a shortage of water. And what we're in need of is thinking how everything could be organized so that we use the natural flows of nature. We don't need to design with innovative materials. We need to learn how to design with the flows that are always around. Because the laws of physics will permit us to do it. Here you see the biggest building in the world, a shopping center. No air conditioning inside. Anyone of you knows this building? Which country do you think it is? It's Zimbabwe, Harare. We would never expect Harare and Zimbabwe to be a leader in architecture. This is the most innovative building design in architecture, ladies and gentlemen, and it's in Africa. Not in Finland, not in Japan. How come we don't see what is happening around the world? And that is why I am here to share with you some of our experiences, first-hand experiences, and this is our bamboo buildings. We need to celebrate the cement and the concrete of nature, which is bamboo. And bamboo, you may not know, is a grass. You cut it, it grows again. You cut it, it grows again. 
You cut it, it grows again. You cut it, it grows again. I don't know why we're obsessed with cutting trees for paper, huh? Because bamboo, you can cut it 70 times before you hurt the roots. 70 times. And how much bamboo paper have you seen around? I am someone who likes to share what we learn. I've been pioneering for 40 years. I've write books about this. But I have become a bit frustrated with the green economy. Why am I frustrated? Because the green economy keeps on fitting into this globalized economy where we always want to cut costs, where we want to be the cheapest. And that means we will squeeze out the workers and those who have been squeezed out, we will subsidize to survive the business. That's why I call the new business model the blue economy. If you don't want to call it blue, call it any other color, but do it. What we're in need of is to be innovative and creative. We need to generate jobs. But in order to generate jobs, you need to generate value. And so we need to design new rules for the market. I'm not against the market. I'm in favor of new rules for the market so that we compete on the basis of the generation of more value with what we have. Empower ourselves to respond to the basic needs of all. And for that, we need a lot of inspiration from a lot of people. Ladies and gentlemen, don't ever think that the projects that are presented are all done by Gunter Pauli. Forget about it. There are hundreds of people in our network with whom we work and operate so that we can move forward. But we need inspiration, and sometimes to get inspiration, we have to be in between two deserts. Here we are in the north of Africa, Morocco. And maybe you know that there was a young pilot of 27 years old who went to Tarfaya, Morocco in order to take care of the post between France and Rio de Janeiro. And that young pilot was trying his plane in the dunes and he landed and found a black rock and he found another black rock, and they were meteorites. Do you know which story was invented? Le Petit Prince, the little prince of Saint-Exupéry. He was in between the Atlantic Ocean and the Sahara. He saw a few rocks, and he imagined the most read book in the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you meditate, but sometimes you need to be in nothingness to imagine greatness. You need to be able to take a step back from the money, from the material, from the house, from the problems that we have. And we need to imagine, just like Saint-Exupéry put it into the little prince, when the fox said, you have to see with your heart. If you're not seeing with your heart, you're not seeing anything. But what I'm seeing today is the region where Saint-Exupéry was is today in total poverty. We have succeeded in making certain that poverty becomes the standard. How can we do that? And worse, young people don't see a future anymore. I mean, what kind of society do we have when the young think that the only right they have is on Friday, not go to school and protest? Sometimes accompanied by the parents who are responsible for the mess. I don't get it. This is not the way forward. We cannot just go for the refugees and the protests. What we need to do is innovate, be creative. So my last 15 minutes, let me share with you a few concrete examples. Do you remember the yo-yo? We all played with the yo-yo. And we know we have to exactly learn when to do this, and then it would keep on going. You remember the kite? You know, we need to do like this, and the kite would go up. What we forget is when we're doing this, we're generating wind. Now, you remember this clock? That was invented in Germany in 1625. And you pull, there is a weight, and there's 750 grams doing tick, tock, tick, tock, 
for eight days in a row, modulating the law of gravity into the same one second. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see if the video works. Have a look at what it means when you start integrating the yo-yo and the German clock and the kite with artificial intelligence and robotics. Here you have a large kite, that's the robot. The robot is equipped to pull the cords. And what we're doing is we're going to lift it up and you will quickly see the yo-yo. That is the green cord that is going back and forth. There's the robot again, ready to be launched. And there we go. The wind takes it, no efforts made. The wind takes it up, it pulls it out. There's the yo-yo. Wow. They made the yo-yo a bit too short in the video. But the yo-yo effect is incredible because it allows us that the wind takes the kite out and then click the robot decides to come back in and we're generating with a turbine power. We demonstrated on the boat we can do this now already 70,000 kilometers from ocean to ocean. It works perfect. Now when it works on the ocean, on the boat, it works on land. We're able to completely shift the logic of how wind energy is not only running when there is wind, it is always running because we're creating our own wind. This is innovation. This is bringing the old traditional tools together, like the yo and the kite, and you transform that into a revolution on the energy side. Because if you can have power with wind, if you can have power with wind 24 hours a day, you can just put one container on one of those tilts in the Maldives and you're powering everything. Or you can take a village in Germany where we have now the first permits to create kite parks, not windmill parks. And we're able to generate power. Now we don't need power 24 hours a day. We normally need only 14 hours a day. And so that means the other 10 hours we're making hydrogen. 24 hour energy generation. Hydrogen locally produced. And our cost price is 3.8 cents kilowatt hour. Goodbye nuclear energy. Goodbye carbon. Because we're competing you out of the market because we have multiple benefits. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how we have to think. We have to outcompete what is there. And we have to think what we have. And the kite, the yo-yo, and the clock are the basis of this. But here we are on a no hotel, and every hotel has an air conditioning system. And every air conditioning system is responsible for emissions, carbon emissions. And I said, let's fix that. And this is what we invented. This is the same hotel. On the top of the hotel, we're farming. Spirulina. Every hotel, every building with an air conditioning, including this building, could have a spirulina farm. Because the air con secures that there's always warm air coming out of the building. Always. And that means we can always have spirulina. Spirulina should become the cheapest. We can do that. We can make spirulina smoothies and the excess of spirulina we can give to the kids at the schools. We're doing that. We're having more than 20 operations already, but ladies and gentlemen, we should have 25,000 of these operations. And what am I missing? I'm missing the entrepreneurs. We're in a society where we've come to a zero risk society. We need to change things and we need to take risks. That's why Planeteers for me is a bunch of entrepreneurs. People who want to do things and will take the risk. Here we are again in Colombia. My wife is Colombian. That explains a little bit why I talk about Colombia more than anything else, perhaps. And this is the place, the savanna, that was a rainforest destroyed by the Spanish 250 years ago. And we decided to regenerate the forest. And we were told that it was not possible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when I'm being told it's not possible, I will do it. 
I know it will take me a little bit longer. But if it's possible, you do it. But if it's impossible, I'll do it. And I think we need to have a group of planeteers who are decided to do it. And here is the forest that was regenerated. But if you have forest, you have water. So we give everyone in the local population drinking water for free. Three liters of drinking water for free. And every child in the same region, 12,000 people, at the age of six will receive a bicycle. What happens with children that ride the bicycle from the age of six all day and drink water? No more diabetes B. They're so healthy, ladies and gentlemen, the kids are so healthy, the population gets so healthy, we had to close the hospital for lack of patients. Or do you want to measure development by the number of beds you have? I prefer to have development on the base of the beds I don't need anymore in the hospitals because we lead a healthy life. We have healthy food. We move. We're not confined. Let's talk about coffee. You know this guy. <laughs> we like him. Actually, there's something very unique about Mr. Clooney. Mr. Clooney, when he holds a cup of coffee with a very famous brand behind it, every lady that has the machine and the capsules thinks that they're drinking coffee with Mr. Clooney. <laughs> and that's why they're willing to pay a premium price. I have nothing against Mr. Clooney and certainly not against his wife. But he has received 120 million euro for endorsing a coffee. We calculate that this is more than the farmers got. I'm sorry, Mr. Clooney, this is not fair. This is not fair. We can do better. And this is what we need. We don't need to say we're against someone. We don't need to say we're against this and against that. What we need to figure out is what is much better. The decision on what is good and bad will be made by someone else. I want to focus on what is better. And better is that today, when you drink a cup of coffee, you're only consuming 0.2%. The coffee cherry, because the coffee is a cherry. We don't eat the flesh, we throw it away. That's where all the antioxidants are. Can you imagine? The greatest source of antioxidants in the world is thrown away, but because we use such a bad chemistry that it's not edible anymore. So go organic. Go natural. So here is the new product. It's called solid coffee. And the solid coffee takes the whole coffee bean. So the farmer who normally has to sell only the beans, and from the beans we only drink the coffee and everything is thrown away, we now have the farmer selling us the whole harvest. The whole harvest means we're buying five times more. We're not generous. We're paying for what he's harvesting. That is how ecosystems work. And we need to think of how are the new consumption models. How can we get more health into our body with what nature is already producing? We cannot ask nature to produce more. We have to do more with what nature is already producing. And one of those phenomena is the thistle. You know the thistle? Cardo. The cardo is considered a weed. We flush it with glyphosate. We decided to take a closer look, and we realized that this beautiful flower is full of an oil. That oil we can extract, and with temperature and pressure, we can convert the oil into an acid. And the stem is made from cellulose. Cellulose we can turn into a sugar. A sugar you can ferment into an alcohol. Are you following me? An alcohol and an acid are bioplastics. We've created the largest bioplastics industry in Europe. Using what? Thistles? We're not competing with food. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not need high tech. We do not need brand, grand innovations. 
We do not need GMOs. We do not need any of that. We need to think for a moment, what do we have available and what can we all use in order to turn around? We didn't have enough sugar, so we needed some sugar beets. And we realized the farmers in Europe are only getting 80 euro a ton for sugar beets. By turning the thistles and the sugar beets around, we're able to provide the farmers 12 times more revenue. Ladies and gentlemen, today being a farmer is being in poverty, living off subsidies. We've turned it around and we can do that and we turned it into a factory that is actually producing bioplastics. And plastics that degrade in the sun, in the sea and in the soil. Because the European Union only defines biodegradation by degrading in the soil. That means what degrades in the soil does not degrade in the sea. Hence the problems with all the plastics and particularly the microplastics in the sea. Let me finish off with a very special case. There is a lot of debate in the world today about 5G. There's a lot of debate about the health effects of 5G. I'm not debating the good and the bad. I'm asking what is the best. And what is the best, I think, is Li-Fi, light-based internet. If I would ask you the question, what goes fastest, the radio or the light? The light. How come we decided to have an internet based on radio when light is much faster? Light is the fastest source of energy of uh, transmission for data we have. And the Wi-Fi is a poor precursor of the internet we will have. Light, street lights, inner door lights. Look at all the LEDs that you see hanging on top of you. Every single lamp in that big block of LEDs, every single individual lamp can transmit data to you at 250 gigs per second. 250 gigs per second while saving 80% energy. Do we realize that the internet is the biggest energy vore of the world today? The biggest energy vore of the world is the internet with all the servers behind it. And by shifting from a few radio waves that are sold for billions to operators, like in Portugal, we are immediately seeing the opportunity to democratize because light has a billion frequencies, whereas radio waves have a couple hundred frequencies available. Li-Fi is the technology of the future. Do you know Oppo, the smartphone from China? They just made a deal with Android, Google to create, to have the first Li-Fi based smartphone on the market 2021. We are going to see light as a carrier and we're debating 5G. What happened to us? What happened to us? Where is the new technology? And if you want to have a social impact, if I'm a blind person and I have to take the Metro, my GPS does not give me the frequencies to know exactly where I am. But if light is my guidance, then I know the centimeter precise where I am. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, half of my work for 40 years has been innovation, getting business models on the market, outcompete those guys who are not willing to move. And the other half of my time is telling stories to children. We need to have a culture that is based on inspiring children. I am from the Pink Floyd generation. We don't need no education. We don't need no mind control. But I would like to inspire the children to imagine a future that is much better than I could imagine. Like making paper from rocks. In China, 
we have now 252 of my fables distributed to all the children in all the schools in China, from three years to 15. We have the biggest challenge to face, that is the responsibility to inspire the next generation. Because if they're inspired, and they believe they can do better than their parents, ladies and gentlemen, they will do much better than we ever imagined in our life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Gunther, for your, well, quite impressive uh, presentation. You, you just showed us a number of cases of out, uh, outbox, uh, outbox thinking and the way that disruptive, um, disrupting uh, business models can really shape the way that things are done and that the planet evolves. So it's, it's, it's not a fable using using this last uh, expression. Um, you use fables to take, to deliver this message to children, to the next generation that you want to inspire. But then you told us, I miss entrepreneurs. How do you, how do we make emerge um, what is needed this entrepreneurial uh, spirit in, in, in the way that you so uh, positively defend? You know, the greatest challenge we have is that we, we have been training people not to take risks. We have been young people when they are born and when my son of six comes out of the bedroom, he's got ideas what he wants to do for the rest of the day. I mean, he's not making a business plan, he's not making an analysis, he's not having an audit of what he's going to do, he just does it. And I think this is what we're missing. We've lost a child in us, this capacity, and that's because of our educational system. Our education has squeezed the entrepreneurship and the spontaneity out of the child. We need to get it back in. And first of all, we need to get back in, in the little child that we still have inside us. So to me, it's a matter of inspiration. It's a matter of making very clear that it's possible. It has been done. You're not the only one. I mean, we can do better together. It's not I or me too. It is we too. We together, we can do it as well. And I think if we are moving from the me too to the we too in a positive way, then I believe that many entrepreneurs will step forward. Ladies and gentlemen, Gunter Paldi. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. And see you tomorrow, Planeteers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.